Good evening, everyone. I'm Jake Yushinowskis, reporting live from West Hartford, Connecticut. This is the first edition of Inside the Huddle, and we're here to talk about a variety of subjects, Yankees, Red Sox, Mets, little NFL comparing to Major League Baseball um, and how those two sports are doing respectively, as well as NBA free agency, which will start in the next few months. Uh, to lead off with the Yankees, obviously one of the more highly talked about topics in sports after acquiring John Carlos Stanton, adding to an already potent lineup with Aaron Judge, Gary Sanchez, Didi Gregorius. They're in a very interesting position where they were able to rebuild at a much faster pace than people thought at first. And all of a sudden, they're the evil empire that they were back in the early 2000s, the late 90s. So Brian Cashman, who deserves most of the credit for assembling the team, has put them in a position where they have arguably the most talented team in baseball without spending as much as the Yankees have been known to spend, staying under the $197 million luxury tax. So with that being said, there's some interesting dilemmas they have with Glyber Torres, Miguel Andujar, uh, who plays second and third in the infield. With the team ready to compete for a championship, it's awfully risky to go into the season with two rookies, albeit talented rookies. So those are just some of the questions that the Yankees have to answer. And in the next couple of weeks, since the season is opening up in two weeks from the day, uh, it, they're good problems to have, don't get me wrong, because when you have talented players, it, it makes it a competition where, you know, for second base will it be Miguel uh, Gleyber Torres or Neil Walker or even Tyler Wade, uh, third, Miguel Andujar or Brandon Drury. So you can't really go wrong with that, with whichever option they choose, but it certainly does make it a second guess 2020 hindsight if the move that the Yankees choose to go with does not pan out. So personally, I think they should go with Miguel Andujar. Uh, the kid has shown a great poise at the plate. He can make contact, hit the ball out of the ballpark. He's a very good line drive hitter. And quite frankly, he possesses a threat at age 23 that not many people can look around and see in Major League Baseball. Um, not to mention he's climbed up to number four in the Yankees prospect list. So he certainly has the stats to back that up. Um, and I know the problem is that he's a rookie and he has a shaky glove, supposedly, uh, that people were worried about uh, interfering with his ability to play every day. But my rebuttal to that is if you're a rookie, there's going to be growing pains. You're going to have lapses both at the plate offensively and in the field defensively. But it's being able to experience those growing pains that would make Andujar or any other rookie a better player in the long run. Uh, you have to play to better yourself from those mistakes. You're not going to improve as a player just sitting on the bench. And let's face it, if he costs the Yankees a game in April or May, you can live with it because chances are with the offense and the rest of the team they have around him, it's not going to cost them games. So I think the leash should be longer for a player like that because you have the luxury of doing so. It's not as if um, you have a team that is so flawed that you need everything to work accordingly, otherwise your game plan fails. So I think with that being said, for rookies, the slack, the, the lease should be long because uh, it's not as if you're gonna be burned and you can't 
make up for it in the long run. And then flipping to the other side of the infield with Gliber Torres, uh, unfortunately he went down with Tommy John surgery last year uh, before he was able to make the major league roster and make his debut. But however, this year he's poised to come back with a vengeance, uh, make his um, major league debut as well as uh, contribute to a Yankee lineup that is very deadly as, as we touched upon. Um, the one thing I will say with Torres, even though the injury came to his non-throwing shoulder, it is important to make sure that uh, he isn't being rushed and that he is 100% healthy because he hasn't played Major League Baseball games in about half a year. So with that being said, um, the Yankees are in a position where they can take time to groom him, make sure he has everything going accordingly in the minor leagues because you don't want him to get off to a bad start and then start questioning himself. And also with the service time issue, the fact that the Yankees can gain another year of control by keeping him in the minors, it certainly seems like a no-brainer. But the trepidation is when uh, Gliber Torres is ready to come to the major leagues, is it going to be Tyler Wade at second base, another prominent Yankees rookie who has shown flashes of excellence in the infield, who projects to be a super utility guy? or Neil Walker, a great bat that they were able to acquire for just $5 million on the open market. So he certainly has competition and it's not gonna be given to him, but you'd think somewhere down the line that he would be given the reins to take over second base and to make a impact uh, down the stretch of the season. So what Brian Cashman has to figure out is since, I'm, since the Yankees are so deep at those numerous positions, does he trade some of the talent, uh, whether it be Andy R. I wouldn't thank Torres because he's one of the best prospects in baseball, but this is a team that he's shown he's going for it with Giancarlo Stan being acquired, uh, taking on that huge contract, so you certainly can't rule anything quite out of the possibility, um, especially the depth that they have, it makes it possible where more options are on the table. Uh, it's just with those options, he has to figure out which buttons are the right to press and which ones, sometimes the best trades are the ones you don't make. So it's not, you know, just because you have options means you have to, you know, trade some of some of them away if you don't have to then you can keep it for depth purposes because as we know in baseball there's a lot of injuries and it's you know you can never have too much depth over the course of a 162 game season so on to the team uh, across the city uh, in the New York Mets as a Yankee fan I will say that um, they did have quite a rough year last year but Seeing the team look mostly the same wouldn't scare me if I were a Met fan because they have uh, tremendous pitching on paper. I know that they didn't show who they quite were last year, but as far as staying healthy goes, it's a crapshoot. You know, there's going to be injuries, but certainly no one expected to the length in which the Mets had last year where every key player, every key pitcher – was battling and uh, experiencing a nagging injury throughout the season. Joanna Cespedes only played 81 games. Uh, Matt Harvey missed most of the year. Noah Syndergaard missed about four and a half months. So they were never really able to uh, get out of the gates running at full steam and everything just snowballed after that. But this team also showed that with a lot of the key pieces from two years ago and even in 2015 that they're capable of being a playoff or even World Series caliber team. Uh, even though the National League is deep from the Dodgers to the Cubs to the Nationals, you know, the Mets have the pitching 
and they'd be a dangerous team if they get even a wild card berth because as we've seen teams ride their starting pitchers arms in October um, they have the potential to be uh, any team's worst nightmare in a short playoff series especially if they can have Johannes Cespedes for closer to 162 games as opposed to half the season so I think uh, they benefited tremendously from the free agency market on bargain deals. Todd Frazier, two years for $17 million. Um, they're a team that was, you know, going under the radar. They didn't make any huge splashes, but they definitely did make splashes that I'd say helped them from a leadership perspective, adding Adrian Gonzalez and Todd Frazier uh, for a clubhouse that was borderline toxic last year. Uh, you know, the Mets couldn't get out of their own way. They were always um, under the microscope, especially in a city like New York, where the media is always, you know, trying to create the next story. And they have veterans now that have been there, have helped locker rooms in the past, as Todd Frazier did this past year with the Yankees. So they certainly benefited from that. And adding Jason Vargas, for a pitching uh, depth move was underrated because Vargas, he wasn't one of the highly sought after free agents, but at the same time, he is coming off an all-star caliber season where um, he had career highs in a lot of the important pitching categories uh, that are looked at. And quite frankly, uh, they have a bullpen where Jerry Reese Familia is coming back from blood clot issues, so you expect that those won't reoccur and he'll be available for most of the year. So the Mets I see as at least contending, if not winning a wild card berth. And once you get in the big dance, as they say, anything's possible in one game. Uh, certainly there's no guarantees as we saw last year. I don't think many people had the Mets going with a 70 win season for this 2017 campaign. But at the same time, baseball is a funny game where one year to the next, it doesn't always hold true um, for good or bad. Nothing's a given. So I see the Mets at least contending. And um, I think both New York teams uh, will have a lot to be proud about. Now, um, going with the MLB and the NFL, topic uh there there's certainly a lot of controversy going around for major league baseball with tanking and uh, <clears throat> how to put an end to that and i think now in this era with sports you know if you're not one of the best teams whether it's the golden state warriors the new york yankees the uh, philadelphia eagles you have great incentive to tank in order to get there because if you're not winning a championship and you're just being mediocre, that's simply not benefiting you in any way. You're not winning you know, championships and you're also not accumulating high draft picks. So there's really nothing to gain. You're just treading water. And uh, it gives more teams across sports in general a reason to lose to intentionally not try their hardest. And it can be demoralizing for a fan base, uh, but obviously for the team's sake, they'll claim it's in their best interest. Especially in baseball, where there's no salary cap, uh, because even the luxury tax, it's a soft salary cap, a team can spend over it, but uh, they're, you know, not penalized besides the fact they have to pay more money um, in the long haul, but they have the option of doing so. And I don't agree with that. I think the way how the NFL has it, where you have a salary cap threshold that you cannot pass no matter what, uh, it evens the playing field out for anyone, small market, big market. You know, the Tennessee Titans have the same chance as the New York Giants or the New England Patriots or the Los Angeles Rams. It's not uh, dictated based on 
where your city is or how much revenue everyone has the same to spend and i think as it's shown with uh the nfl i think that's a better way to have more parity because the nfl it you know you have the philadelphia eagles who come out of nowhere you're always going to have great teams in every sport but in the NFL, you have the Chiefs one year who do great. You have the Jacksonville Jaguars who surprise people. Uh, the Cleveland Browns look like they're making moves this offseason. And so with everyone having the same amount of money, it gives everyone equal chance to spend and to even out the playing surface. And I think that has to be uh, the elephant in the room for Major League Baseball. I mean... You have a lot of teams that are not doing much of anything at all, whereas it's been a robust free agent market. Um, and you look at teams in the NFL, they're spending, they're spending efficiently. It's a much better market to be in as far as a player goes than Major League Baseball. <coughs> and at the end of the day, they're doing better as a business than Major League Baseball uh, as reason for the reasons I just mentioned. I think it's a no-brainer that Major League Baseball has to take a page out of the uh, NFL notebook because it's worked so well for them and Major League Baseball is stuck in the mud trying to figure out how to stop uh, teams from tanking because if the Yankees can spend hundreds of millions more than the Tampa Bay Rays, what incentive do the Rays have to actually pay players at the premium value when they're not going to be benefiting from it as much as the New York Yankees would. So I think um, definitely Major League Baseball needs to address that. Now, will they? I don't believe so because uh, that Major League Baseball has never had a salary cap uh, and they just recently went with the luxury tax so I don't see them going full board to the salary cap, but it's something that I think you'll continue seeing these problems of tanking and small market teams being at a huge disadvantage. So it's something where Major League Baseball has to look themselves in the mirror and say, what can we do to eliminate this? Otherwise, it'll get really ugly with the majority of the teams trying to finish at the bottom as opposed to the top. And for my next topic with uh, the NBA, as we were touching on earlier in the show, uh, you know, it's been talked about a lot with the 2018 free agent class, LeBron James, uh, Paul George, DeMarcus Cousins, a lot of big names, that are gonna be on the open market. I think LeBron is definitely leaving Cleveland. Um, I don't think it's really much of a decision that's gonna to be too hard for him because he's already shown he can leave Cleveland once. And I feel that there's much more attractive options out there with the Lakers being a young and up and coming team, the Houston Rockets, having the pieces already there. And I feel that whether it's the 76ers with Joel Embiid, Ben Simmons, they all have younger, better, more energizing teams than the Cavaliers who are, as I said before, they're muddling and they're halfway in, halfway out. They're not young and up and coming uh, and they're, peep they're peaking. You know, they don't have much of a ceiling to hit after this year because most of their stars are either overpaid, like J.R. Smith, Tristan Thompson. They're both accumulating the majority of the Cavaliers' cap space, uh, and they're certainly not living up to that production. So when you have two players who are getting paid a lot not earning their uh, paychecks, it certainly creates problems with, uh, having an effective team, whereas the Lakers and 76ers both have star players on their rookie deals, Brandon Ingram, Lonzo Ball, 
uh, even Julius Randle, who they're not accumulating as much, but they're certainly producing more. So I think that certainly has to be something that uh, can attract LeBron because he knows as he's getting older, already in his age 33 season, he won't have to uh, carry the burn as much as opposed to being on the Cavaliers where he feels like he's playing his best basketball in his career. And they're 39 and 28 as a team, which we've seen LeBron James obviously carry teams with much less talent to 60 win seasons. And this season in a weak Eastern conference, he's having uh, the season that he says is best in his career and they're fourth in the conference. So, I think something definitely has to be said about how when LeBron's getting older, as great as he is, uh, you have to worry about father time over the course of an 82-game season. And uh, I think, you know, with him being able to lead the team but also have those great pieces around him, would be much more enticing than staying in Cleveland because he he has won his championship that he promised the city of Cleveland. And there's no shame in leaving again if he feels that there's better opportunities elsewhere. He's done everything the city could have asked for, um, whether it's being a role model, having great, uh, having great attitudes towards the fan base, towards the owner, Dan Gilbert, who hasn't always treated him the best. So I think something has to be said about him paying his dues, earning his stripes, and basically being allowed to do whatever he wants without having any backlash. Because even though in 2010, he was uh, probably irresponsible about the way how he went about the decision, it certainly, you know, He's made up for it in many ways, more than enough that, you know, the city could forget about that as a blimp and just uh, look at him as LeBron James, one of the greatest players we've ever known. So I think whether it's Philadelphia, Houston, or L.A., uh, all three of those teams have tremendous positives whether it's the Rockets being one piece away, like a LeBron James caliber player from winning a championship, or uh, the Lakers being LeBron and Paul George away type of player from winning a championship. But I think with the marketing opportunity in LA and to build LeBron's brand, that's something that separates the Lakers from other organizations because When you have a team like the Lakers who play in such a big market, Houston's a big market and Philadelphia, they're obviously very intense about their sports, but LeBron has uh, two houses in LA that LA just markets more. He can get more endorsements. And quite frankly, it just gives him that much more opportunities on and off the court. Not to mention that the prestige and the aura of being in Los Angeles following the footsteps of Kobe Bryant and other greats like Shaquille O'Neal. The Sixers and Houston Rockets, they have great histories respectively, but nothing compares to the Lakers. And I think that LeBron, being the basketball nut that he is, he definitely is aware of that. So I think with both the brand, the marketing, and uh, the history, I would be pretty surprised with all those advantages that the Lakers have in their favor if they don't land LeBron. The one caveat to that is that the Lakers have to close out the season strongly because they're not going to be playing in the playoffs, and they have to show LeBron that they can win already without him and that he would be the piece that would get them over the top with Paul George because they can offer two max contracts this offseason because as great as the history and the marketing would be if the Lakers can't show that they can be a successful organization and play strong to finish the year then LeBron would have less incentive to go because also as great as as great as 
and important as those two categories are with history and marketing, uh, LeBron cares about winning the most. So to add those to the winning component would be what would get the Lakers over the top, but the winning has to come first. And they've shown that, you know, they have 31 wins already this year. Uh, Brandon Ingram's taken a step forward in his career. Lonzo Ball has shaken off the doubters that have said profusely he can't shoot. He's been hitting three pointers at a 41% clip the last 15 games. And also Luke Walton has gained the respect of players like Julius Randle, who they butted heads earlier in the year, but he's earned the trust of the locker room as opposed to in past years where the Lakers were going through long losing skids. You don't see that now. You see more togetherness, camaraderie, and they enjoy playing with themselves more so than in the past. So I think they're well on their way to finishing the year strong and then having the ability to make a strong pitch with the reasons I mentioned. And the big part to having LeBron come to the Lakers that isn't even on the Lakers right now is Paul George because Paul George has to go to LA for LeBron to have the visualization that he can go to the Lakers with Paul George with another superstar already in his prime and they can be that dynamic duo that brings dominance back to Los Angeles again. Uh, I think if Paul George were to stay in Oklahoma City or go to another organization then LeBron could view the Lakers as a playoff team with him, a team that has promise, but in the Western Conference where you have the Golden State Warriors, the Houston Rockets, you need more than just LeBron and a bunch of young 20-year-old players out there. You need experienced players who have been to the playoffs and know what the war of playing basketball in May and June is about. So I think with LeBron, Paul George, Brandon Ingram, Lonzo Ball, and maybe even Julius Randle squeezing into the plans this offseason, I think that would be uh, exactly what the Lakers could have hoped for, and it would set them up for at least the next five to six years um, because they not only have LeBron who – is at the end of his prime, but still playing at a high level. But you have players like Lonzo Ball, Brandon Ingram showcasing their futures currently speaking. And I think uh, it it truly would be great for basketball to have Los Angeles back to being relevant because like the Knicks, Celtics, Lakers, if those three franchises are doing well, then certainly the game of basketball follows in doing well also signing off from west harford this is jake schnauskas with uh inside the huddle